And now we want to look at the mosaics on the triumphal arch. Uh, this is the arch uh, that separates the nave from the apse or the sanctuary. Uh, it's uh, Santa Maria Maggiore. Unfortunately, I have a black and white image of the overall uh, thing. But we're going to look at some of the details. The scenes show the infancy of Christ. And here you see in various bands uh, the Annunciation, uh, when the angel Gabriel comes and announces to Mary that she will bear the Christ child. Uh, below that we see an adoration of the Magi. And then below that you see the massacre of the innocents. One of the things that you will notice is Mary here is represented as Queen of Heaven. Uh, she's not shown as, um, you know, sort of a, a lower class carpenter's wife. Uh, she's dressed in garments uh, that are appropriate for a uh, imperial princess and uh, or an imperial queen. And now the reason for that, of course, is that Mary was declared at the Council of Ephesus the Theotokos, the God-bearer, the mother of God. And who would be uh, the queen? Well, sometimes the queen is the wife of a king, but also the mother of a king. Um, we used to talk about the queen dowager. Uh, in England, they talked about her as the queen mum, uh, a little more informally. Um, but the mother of the reigning monarch is also a queen. And of course, uh, uh, since Christ has uh, no wife, uh, you have uh, the queen of heaven is his mother, the God-bearer, the mother of God. So Mary is enthroned in a sense. We'll see her. She has a retinue of angels who stand beside her. And she's wearing this golden and richly decorated garment with a diadem as though she were a, a, a Byzantine or early Christian imperial uh, princess or queen. And, uh, you know, queens don't just uh, go around without anybody around them, so she definitely has her retinue, uh, who in this case happens to be angels. Now, if you're familiar with later Annunciation, say the 15th century, um, the iconography here is a little bit different. Uh, we see Mary as Queen of Heaven working the veil of the Temple of Jerusalem. Uh, and this comes out of a, uh, a gospel that's seen as apocryphal. It's not part of the canonical Bible. Uh, what was Mary doing when uh, the angel came to tell her that she was going to bear the Christ child? Um, According to this, uh, and this does not correspond with um, Jewish practice, uh, they don't really have any nuns, as it were, uh, but uh, the Mary and uh, other young ladies were taken into the temple, uh, and they are, uh, and she's, she is weaving or uh, working uh, the veil of the temple of Jerusalem, That's what she was doing. And you see the angel Gabriel is flying in. And also the dove of the Holy Spirit. Remember that uh, in Luke, uh, when they're talking about the Annunciation, uh, angel, the uh, angel Gabriel comes and tells Mary to fear not uh, and that she will be uh, uh, the mother of the Savior. And, you know, and she says, how can this be? I know no man, I'm a virgin. And he says, the the uh, power of the Holy Spirit will overshadow you and you, you will conceive by the Holy Spirit. In other words, you will still remain a virgin. The power of God uh, will conceive Christ, will conceive Jesus. And so, and here you see, uh, as, as far as I know, this is the earliest Annunciation scene, uh, but certainly uh, you see uh, the dove of the Holy Spirit coming in, sort of an angle, uh, almost like a, a torpedo. <laughs> Uh, headed right toward her. And of course, that symbolism remains with us uh, for centuries and centuries right up till today. Uh, that the dove of the Holy Spirit is shown as, uh, the Holy Spirit is shown as a dove uh, because later on in the Bible, at the 
baptism of Christ. Uh, it says that the Holy Spirit uh, appears as a dove, a metaphor. Uh, and so then uh, the dove becomes a symbol of the Holy Spirit and can be applied in different scenes. One of the things we should point out that this is a very important scene for Christians. Um, the moment when Mary conceives Christ is not, you know, not just, oh, now she's getting pregnant, she'll later have Christ. Uh, it's the moment of the incarnation. I-N-C-A-R-N-A-T-I-O-N. And you can see in that the word carne, uh, which means flesh or meat. Uh, so this is the moment when uh, God takes on human flesh, when God becomes man. And for Christians, this is the first sacrifice that leads to the ultimate sacrifice of the cross. One of the things we want to notice is the style of the triumphal arch mosaics. Now, the imagery or the iconography is newly created in the fifth century in response to Mary's elevated status as mother of God, which was declared in 431 at the Council of Ephesus. So these images cannot copy earlier examples. And what we see is that the style has become more linear and the figures are more elongated. In other words, the head is smaller in relationship to the body or the, bo the figure is stretched longer and thinner. Um, and I'm comparing these here to uh, the images that we just saw on the nave wall. And we believe that those images on the nave wall actually do copy earlier um, Bible illustrations. But here, they're creating with the, the style of the time, if you will. Um, if you look at the background, yes, they have a, a building here. Uh, but the background really is made up of colored bands. Uh, and the background space seems to be flattened. It seems to be um, very, very shallow, if you will. Uh, the figures could almost be pasted on the background. So the background space is flattened with broad bands of color and that there is an emphasis on pattern. And we're going to, we see this in, for example, the garment of Mary. Um, all of these stylistic elements are characteristic of a more abstract style. So we see them moving toward a Byzantine, otherworldly linear abstraction. They're not completely abstract. Uh, figures still turn in space. Uh, you do have indication of drapery folds, although the draperies seem to be more linear. Uh, there's less um, a shading. There's less uh, in-between shades of, of, of the, the uh, colors of the drapery folds uh, than with the made nave mosaics. And here we're looking at the Adoration of the Magi. Uh, Christ is enthroned. Uh, he's on this cushioned throne. He has a uh, bejeweled footstool. His, his legs don't read, his feet don't, his feet do not reach the footstool, but uh, we see him uh, seated there. So he's enthroned as though he is an emperor, the king of heaven, uh, on a Byzantine style throne, which is bejeweled with a large poofy pillow. Uh, and he has that retinue of four angels behind the throne. Uh, except for the smaller size, Christ is not childlike. He's fully divine as well as fully human. So he sits erect and his proportions are those of a miniature adult rather than uh, an infant who would have a larger head and probably couldn't sit up like that. Now we have one magus and these are the people who are wearing, it looks like jeweled tights. Uh, these are very exotic costumes. Uh, one magus, uh, or wise man, uh, stands on the left. He points upward to the star of Bethlehem, which is directly over Christ's head, sort of uh, between the heads of the, of the two angels that are uh, most central. Um, and the, um, 
two other magi are approaching from the other side. So you've got, the Bible says there are three gifts, so they're usually represented with three magi. Uh, it seems that they are emerging from the city, uh, probably the uh, city of Bethlehem, uh, and they're bearing uh, gifts, which I have to admit, they look to me like they're bringing pizzas to the Christ child, but presumably uh, these are uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Uh, with the very circular platters that they're carrying them on. Uh, the garments are considered very exotic, Eastern garments. And we see Mary uh, seated to the left of the throne and another female figure to the right. And frankly, I'm not sure. Is it supposed to be his grandmother, St. Anne? Is it supposed to be a symbolic figure of the church? I just don't know. I've been very curious about that. If anybody finds out, let me know. And here we're looking on the opposite side. Uh, don't have really good details of this, but we see at the top uh, the dream of Joseph uh, that uh, uh, sends the family into Egypt. And this uh, may be, I'm sure, the Holy Family in Egypt. And then down below you see the Magi uh, before Herod. So he's sending them out to find the Christ child and tell him. So he says so that he can pay homage, but of course we all know the story. We know that uh, Herod, the king, is planning uh, to kill the infant Christ child. Okay, here's the, here's the opposite side. I'm just going to quickly go through these. We have the dream of Joseph, a scene that may be the Holy Family in Egypt, I'm not quite sure, and then the Magi, the Magi before Herod. So here we're looking at uh, the angel coming to tell Joseph that he should take the, the Christ child. Uh, well, there's two dreams of Joseph. It could be the angel coming to tell him that it's all right to marry Mary, she's actually a virgin, she's conceived by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and then uh, there's also the angel uh, who comes to Joseph in a dream and tells him uh, to flee to Egypt, taking uh, the newborn Christ child and his mother with them because Herod is seeking to kill them. So we have uh, Joseph uh, sleeping with a uh, large rusticated stone wall behind him. Uh, and then we have a scene, I'm not quite sure what this one is. It may be uh, the Holy Family in Egypt. Uh, and then here we see the Magi, uh, before they came uh, to adore the Christ child, they've come to Herod, to the king, to try to find out where this uh, newborn king will be play, uh, will be, uh, with, where they can find the newborn king. Herod is not very happy about that. Uh, he ch checks with his wise men here, whom we see in white, uh, and then uh, tells the Magi to look for him in Bethlehem, uh, but to come back and tell me uh, where you have found him. Uh, and uh, he says he's going to bear homage to him, but of course he's going to try to have uh, the Christ child and killed, and to do that he kills all of the infant boys. Um, you might notice that Herod is uh, labeled very, very clearly. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, one of the things that they often do in the art to make sure you know who people are. Uh, you sometimes will find names. Now to summarize, Santa Maria Maggiore contains two cycles of fifth century mosaics. The nave wall mosaics are seen from the Old Testament and are believed to copy illustrations from an earlier, maybe a fourth century, Bible. Uh, one that no longer exists, but that exhibited the characteristics of classical illusionism. The mosaics on the arch between the nave and the apse represent the infancy of Christ in a more abstracted style. This is new iconography, emphasizing Mary as the Queen of Heaven. It reflects the ruling of the Council of Ephesus that Mary is the Theotokos, the God-bearer or mother of God.